Whoa. Good morning, Saints. Good morning. My name is Pete Cabrera Jr. with the Royal Family International um, School of Identity and Lifestyle. I want to do a quick live. Um, guys, I'm going to be doing a Bible study on Monday. Um, and I'm kind of letting you guys know what the Bible study is going to be about. So you guys can um, read, right? So uh, for you guys that are wondering what it's going to be about, it's going to be about the origin story of Moses. And it's going to be very interesting because um, if you guys heard the Bible study that I did on Esther, you'll find out that the story that I did on Esther, um, I went really deep. I went into the scriptures. I broke down some things. You know, I had a really, really good response from people. They're like, we didn't even know that that was an Esther. We didn't even know the stuff you're pointing out. Like I went all the way in and just broke it down. Um, why the story of Esther is so important. It was called story, uh, Esther's answer to the fall of man. And, uh, if you listen to that Bible study, I broke down, you know, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, um, Haman, Mordecai, like what was the reason that they were in the story, how the political, um, the political arena was between the um, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And a lot of people don't even know about that. Most Christians don't even know um, about the sons of Leah, who were the 10 sons, and then the, the daughters of Rachel, who were Joseph and Benjamin. And this was the separation of the two kingdoms, which is the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel. And so there was a political issue going on. And it was about... Um, they're trying to destroy God's seed. They're trying to destroy the Messiah that was to come. And the enemy was using, using Haman and why that's so vital. <coughs> Talked about how the story of Joseph um, is about the story of Christ and how um, Esther remembered. And you find out later on that Esther is actually a child of, of Benjamin. She's from the lineage of Benjamin, who was the last son that was left. And there was so much that I broke down um, if you want to know about that, it's on www.royalfamilymedia.net. And I explained the story of Esther. And I explained it in a way that um, is taught rabbinically. It's, it's a rabbinical teaching. The way you're taught as a rabbi, the way you're taught as a, a teacher that teaches disciples and the in-depth um, background. And so I'm going to do that with Moses. Like, I am not going to give you surface level. And this is what's beautiful about the story of Moses is um, I'm going to show you the difference between uh, seeing and seeing because that's what it's all about. It's about um, the word uh, Yar and and Yar spent uh, just, it's pronounced Vayar, but there's a difference. There's two words that are used throughout Exodus, and it's a powerful word, but you don't really get it because you're reading it in in the context of a Westerner. <clears throat> but these two words are powerful and you know this right off jump. I'll give you a little taste of what I'm talking about. That way come Monday, uh, Monday night, you can be prepared. So just read the Exodus story. Uh, just read all the way up to where he, he pulls them out. Um, and he brings them back to, to the burning bush and the burning bush is, uh, it's on Mount Sinai. But if you read the scriptures, it doesn't say Sinai. It's, it has another name. So the name means it's the same thing, but it changes. It's very interesting how before Moses brings them back because he sees the burning bush, God tells him, bring them back to this place. It's very interesting because you're wondering, why do, does he need to bring them back to this place? And there's this word that's used throughout Exodus, and it's, he saw, he saw, he saw. And that word is vayar, vayar. And that word is not the other word that they're using because there's two words um, for instance, when Pharaoh's daughter sees Moses, the word she says, she saw, she saw. And that word is what uh, which means it's not the same word that's used when Moses sees. He sees different. It's very interesting. And these two words mean two totally different things. And so the scriptures want you to know that Moses was seen different. Right, which means that when he saw the word is Yar, which means he sees beyond. He sees beyond the surface level. He sees what's going on. He has the ability to see things as they are, <clears throat> and he'll look 
deeply and he sees beyond. And it's very interesting. Um, you'll find out later on. I'm going to break this down in the Bible study. There's so much to this that when he sees the burning bush, it says he saw the burning bush. And that's the same word. And he's, he looked at it and he asked himself, why is, not, why is this bush not burning? Because it's, it looks like a bush that's on fire. But he looks and he sees beyond the fire. He sees beyond the normal. And because of that, because he could see beyond, he saw what God was trying to show him. And in the same way, I'm going to talk about it uh, in the story of, of, of Exodus, how when he sees, the first thing that he sees, it's very interesting. The first time they use this word with Moses is when he sees um, an Egyptian um, soldier uh, hitting a slave and he says he saw and that's the word like he saw beyond he didn't see an Egyptian hitting a slave he saw the man like he saw what was going on he saw what was going on he saw beyond the regular and the norm and because he saw what was really going on um, and this is so vital because as Christians we see things but we don't really see what's going on and why it's happening and what's beyond what the surface level of what our eyes see and it's very interesting. I'm going to break all this down in the Bible study on Monday. I'm going to show you how Moses, uh, you know, his name, the name they gave him, uh, they called him Moses because she drew him out. And his name means draw you out. And it's very interesting because the name that Pharaoh's daughter gave him was draw you out. And that's his life. His life at that point, the minute he got his name, draw you out. That was who he was. God is going to use him to draw the people out, to draw uh, things out. And you find out when he leaves, when he, he kills the, um, he kills the Egyptian, it says that he hides him. He hides him. It's very interesting because the scriptures want you to know that there's something hidden. It's very interesting. There's something hidden, something that, that, that's hidden, that he's hiding something. It's something that he knows, something that is inside of him that's being hidden. And when he buries the Egyptian, he's really burying his identity. He's burying who he is. He's burying what's inside. And when they find out that he killed an Egyptian, when they find out, it says, oh, they know. And now they know something that's hidden, right? And I talked about this in Esther, how um, she has to go before the king with something that's hidden and it could get her killed. And in the same way, um, what is hidden could get him killed. And then you find out that Pharaoh uh, wants to kill him because of that. And it's very interesting because he, they found out that he had killed something. And this goes all the way back with, with Cain, Cain and Abel, because Moses killed his brother, which was an Egyptian, because he was now considered an Egyptian. And he killed um, an Egyptian, which means he, he killed him. And because of that, he had to leave. This is... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on all this. Moses has to leave. He leaves the, the presence of, of the king. It says that, that he leaves his presence. He has to leave. And so there's so much in that. And so the scriptures are trying to show us, it's trying to draw some things out in the story of Moses. And what's beautiful is that one of the things that you hear, and I'm going to be talking about this on the Bible study, is the first thing he does when he leaves is he sits down and he's at a well. And it says that there's seven daughters that come to him. Very interesting. And these seven daughters come. And what's he do? He does what he did the first time. He stands up and he says, this isn't right. This is what he's doing. It's very interesting because he has the DNA of, of, of the Hebrews. He's a Hebrew. He has the DNA of the children of God. Like that's his DNA. But his power and his stature comes from, from Egypt because he's a prince. Right. And so he's standing up. So there's something inside of him that's being drawn out. It's very interesting. It's being drawn out and God's trying to draw it out of him first. And so when he goes to the land of Moab, when he's there, the daughters come. And it's very interesting because of what it says. It says this is very interesting. You wouldn't even get this unless you understood the context of the way it's being written. It says, um, uh, right here. Now the priests of Midian had seven daughters and they came and drew water. That's funny because it, that's his name, draw, to draw them out. They came to draw water and filled, uh, and filled 
through the water in their father's flock. So basically they came to feed the flock, which is another story because they want you to know that there's sheep involved. There's, you're going to hear later on that there's sheep involved again. You're going to find out. So basically these people want to draw water for their sheep, but somebody's not letting them. Someone's not letting the daughters, there's seven of them. I'm going to explain to you why there's seven daughters and why the, the text wants you to know that. It's very vital that you know why is there seven daughters. Why do they have sheep? Why are they not allowing these sheep to drink? What is going on? And Moses does it again. And the word that it uses here, I'm going to read it to you. Now, the priest of Midian had seven daughters. Now, that was a priest. So you find out later on that his father-in-law was a priest. I'm going to talk about his son, Gershom, and, and the circumcision and why God wanted to kill Moses. So much to this. Um, now, the priests of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled through the water their father's flock. Their father's flock. Okay, here we go. And the shepherds came and drew them away, but Moses stood up and he held them and he watered their flock. So he stopped them and he said, no, this is his name, right? And he goes, uh, and when they came to Reuben, their father, he said, who is it that you've come uh, so soon today? And they said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherd. <laughs> He's already delivering people he's this is origin story like what's going on with them on the inside like what's happening and they also drew water enough for us and watered the flock so he gave it to them and the flock which is very interesting because these women are not hebrews so he's not just drawing for the flock he's not just drawing for the sheep he's also drawing for the women of moab who are the daughters of a priest who's a pagan this is very interesting and so you go down um, and he says, and it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. It's very interesting because if you go to um, John chapter four, verse seven through 31, you hear the same story, but the story is Jesus sitting in a well and a woman comes to him to draw water and he asked her to draw water. And then he tells her, if you knew the water that I had, Okay, he's at a well, and I'm going to talk about all this. So Jesus does the exact same thing. So Moses is doing, it's very, it's very, very amazing how the scriptures are tying it all together and trying to tell you a story. But here's what's amazing. In 20, and God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. That word in Genesis chapter uh, 225, looked upon, is the same word that they use with Moses, and it's, uh, yar, and it means to look beyond. So he's not just looking at his people. He's intensely looking at the situation. He's looking at everything that's going on. So he looks beyond the surface level and he hears the cries of his people. And so I'm going to talk about this on Monday. I'm going to talk about <clears throat> the origin story of how he became who he was and how God was using these circumstances, how he was using Egypt and how he was using all the circumstances, and we're going to break that down. And I'm going to break it down in a way that you're going to get what it is that the scriptures are trying to show you and what it is they're trying to say. And you'll find out that he goes to the burning bush, and they use that word again when he sees it. He looks at it. You know, and I'm going to break this down on Monday. He looks at this bush, and he, re he realizes something. He looks beyond the bush. He's like, okay, this bush is on fire. But he looks closer, and he says, wait a minute. This thing's not consumed but it's on fire. And it's very interesting because uh, trees and bushes, right? We're gonna find out in scriptures that uh, you hear about what does the tree represent? Why is the tree on fire? What is this tree that's on fire? And we talk about the knowledge of good and evil, right? Like you know what to do. <clears throat> you know morally what's right and what's wrong. And God is speaking to him and letting him know that morally there's something going on that's not right and we need to fix what's not right. And what's not right is my people are enslaved. And you find out that God tells Moses, he tells him, don't come close. Don't come close. Right. And it's very interesting because I'm going to break down in the Bible study why he says don't come close. And then you're going to find out why uh, the, the mountain is not called Sinai until after they leave Egypt. And then they start calling it Sinai. Right. And you're going to like, why did the name change? Because when you read it, you think it's two different mountains. 
but it's the same mountain. And why is that we don't know what mountain it is until after he comes out and people are like, well, is that a different mountain? Is that the same mountain? It's the same mountain. And we're going to talk about why did God say bring them to this mountain? And first it was a tree that was on fire. The tree was on fire first. But then when he comes back, you find out later on that the mountain's on fire. Why is the mountain on fire? And then he says, tell the people not to come near. So it's like, wait a minute. First you tell Moses not to come near. Then you tell the people not to come near. Like, what are you doing here? What, what are you trying to show us, Lord? What are you trying to show us, God, in the text? Like, what are you trying to tell us? All right, and I'm going to break that down on what it is that's going on. We're going to talk about, you know, the Ten Commandments, the conversation that God and Moses have. Uh, we're going to talk about what's this relationship, you know, and why am I bringing up Moses? I'm also going to talk about why did God bury Moses? Because the Bible tells us that God buried Moses. And the, the text says that the words that they use, the wording that they use in scriptures, that he physically buried Moses, which means that he dug the hole and put Moses in the grave. Now, we're going to talk about why he did that. Why did God bury Moses? And why do you see Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration when Elijah's there, but Elijah didn't die? So Elijah died, and Mo uh, Elijah didn't die, but Moses died, but yet he says, I'm the God of the living. So why do you see Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration? What is going on there? You know, I'm going to talk about all that on Monday night. So Monday night, read the story of Exodus. See what you can get out of it. Prepare yourself. I'm going to call it, I don't know, maybe the origin story of Moses, maybe um, drawing out, like the drawing out of Moses. I don't know. I'll call it something. But, um, you know, I'm sitting here. I'm going through the verses. I'm going through the scriptures. I'm breaking it down. You know, I'm looking beyond the surface level. And that's what's amazing is when you read your scriptures, you can't just look. You can't just look at the scriptures. You can't just stare at them. You have to go beyond. You have to draw out of the scriptures. You have to draw out what it is that God is saying. You have to draw it out. It's not enough just to see it. It's not enough just to go over your word and look at it. You have to draw out what it is that God is saying, right? So we're going to have fun with this, right? So you want to look beyond. It's looking at the inner circumstances. It's looking beyond surface level. And you find out that Moses has compassion. You find out later on that uh, the daughter of Pharaoh has compassion, sees the child sitting there, and she has compassion, and she draws him out. And it's just so much. It's These stories, uh, they set up, like, what I love about um, the five books of Moses is when you read them, there's so much in there. There's so much depth in the word of God. And really what God is doing when you're trying to draw out what it is God is saying, really what God is doing is he's drawing you out because in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh. So the word was drawn out through Christ and Christ walked out the word and drew it out, drew it out of who he is, out of the spirit. And he was the water and he had everything. And you're going to find out later on you know, why Moses strikes the rock. There's so much to that, man. Why he strikes it, why he speaks to it. Um, what is it that God is doing with Moses? He's training him, he's teaching him. And then you find out Aaron's his brother. You know, then you're gonna find out, you know, why is it that Moses said that he wasn't well-spoken, that he couldn't speak and that Aaron would speak for him, that God would make Moses uh, as God to Pharaoh. What, what is that about? You know, is he God to Pharaoh? You know, why is Aaron speaking for him? Why does he give him the stick? What does the stick represent? Okay, why does he throw down the stick? Why does it turn into a snake? Why does it swallow the two snakes? Are these, is this magic? Is this really the power of the enemy? These, these, these magi, why did they use the word? Um, um, they were charmed or they were, um, the word that they use is, uh, um, I think it's charmed, something like that. But anyways, so we're going to talk about these things and, Guys, really, I just want you to get excited about the word. I get excited when I read it because I've learned to really draw out of it. And I've been diving into my word. And I say, you know what? And I do these Bible studies. I don't want to give people the regular Bible study that you would get, you know, as a Christian. Like, well, you know, this is, this is how we apply it. Hey, how about we read it the way God applied it? And then we can dive into God's world. Instead of pulling out the scriptures and turning it into what we think it is, how about we, we give ourselves to the word? How about we allow God to show us his lens 
and bring us into his world because that's what Jesus did. Jesus came into our world to show us, hey, what you've been seeing, you know, the, 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 with the surface level stuff that you've been seeing, I get that, but there's something beyond that, right? And even Jesus talks about it. If the eye is dark, how great is that darkness? But if the eye is light, the whole body's light. And the word that he uses there is, is ien tova. Ien tova means the eye is light, which means you're seeing from the perspective and the right lens, the eye of light, which means you're seeing the way God wants you to see. You're seeing things clearly. You're seeing what it really stands for. What does the burning bush really stand for? What does the mountain on fire really stand for? What does Moses going into Egypt stand for? What does it mean that he was in the ark for three months? What does that mean? What does it mean they drew him out of the river? What does that mean? What does it mean they hid him? Uh, what, is, what does all this mean? In surface level, it's just a story. But when you understand the language that God is using, when you understand what his, his, um, what his intent in the verses and what he's saying, it's mind boggling. It's mind boggling. So much hidden there. And so I want to draw it out and I want to give it to you. So that's what the Bible studies are about. So guys, Monday night, I'm going to have the Bible study on Exodus. Start reading it. Um, I told everybody before I had the other Bible study, just read the story of Esther, see what you can get. And then I, I had talked to the guys after we did it and they're like, man, we didn't see any of that like we did everything you just talked about like we could not see it for some reason we didn't know any of that and i said the reason you don't know that is because you're reading it from a lens and there's another lens that you can read it from and when you read it from that lens you understand the backstory you don't just look at the surface level of the story you see what's what god's trying to pull out of the story what he's trying to bring to the forefront to give you the entire story Instead of just a story, you're getting everything. And you're like, wow, there's so much to this. And so, guys, Monday night, story of Moses, we're going to do Exodus, right? We're going to talk about Exodus. So it's going to be the Exodus story and the origin story. So, guys, I love you guys in the name of Jesus. If you want to see the other Bible studies, um, you can get the, the one that's on YouTube right now. You can go to my YouTube page, subscribe to my channel. I'll put them there. If you subscribe to my channel and do my Bible study on YouTube, you get the notification and you see it live. And then what I do after I put it on there is I'll take it down and then I'll edit it. I'll put the scriptures in. I'll, I'll refine it for you so it's just solid all the way through. I break it down. I sit down. It's, it's a lot of work, man. But you know what? I got to draw things out. And the same way that Moses did it, the same way that Christ did it, is we have to feed his sheep. And what is it that we feed the sheep? So I'm gonna give you an example of what I'm talking about. Okay, can I give you an example of what I'm talking about? I'll show you. Okay, this is something that we talked about last night. We talked about this last night. Uh, hey, Katie. Hey guys, hey, what's up, Joel? What's up, Asiya? What's going on? Yeah. What's going on, guys? I'm gonna read this to you, okay? Let me grab this real quick. Hold on, give me a second. Boom. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, Katie. Oh, Jesus. Sorry, guys. That was funny. Sorry, guys. Oh, Jesus. What's up, Joe? You're doing keto, that's good, man. That's really, really good. Uh, I'm gonna show you guys something, right? Um, because I got into this conversation. I got into this conversation last night because, you know, I, if you guys know, I'm putting out, I'm putting out uh, the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is uh, about what it is that scripture actually says and what it is we actually believe. And one of the guys had asked me a question. And one of the question was um, that casting out devils is for Christians because 
Jesus said in Matthew 15, he said something that proves that you can cast a demon out of a Christian. I'm going to read it to you. Um, but they're taking it out of context. And I said, well, I hear what he's saying, but that's not what Jesus is saying. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain to you what people believe, okay? What people believe according to what the word is actually saying. There's a big difference between what you believe and what the word is saying, okay? Uh, okay, it's in 1521. I'm going to read it to you, okay? And then you can decide for yourself once you get into the scriptures, okay? So then Jesus went hence and departed into the coast of Tyre in Sidon. Now, remember that, Sidon, okay? Everything you read, don't just read it. Don't just surface level read this stuff. Look at it and say, why do they want us to know he's in the coast of Tyre and Sidon? Why, why do they want you to know that he's in this area? It's very vital, okay? And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast. Came out of the same coast. It's very interesting. And cried unto him, saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she cries after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Which means that this woman is not one of the lost sheep of Israel. This is a Gentile woman, okay? Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not lawful to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. <clears throat> now, here's what people will tell you. People will tell you that <clears throat> when he said it is not lawful to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs, means that what he's going to do, what he's going to do should be done to the children of God. Now, remember, He's sent to the lost sheep of Israel, which means these are the ones that are lost, okay? Lost means they're not in the fold, okay? The lost sheep. So if they're lost, they're not in the fold, okay? So he's sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Remember, he came to show them that he was the Messiah. He came to show everybody he was the Messiah. So until they received him as Messiah, they couldn't enter the kingdom of God. So everyone that he's going to, he wants to bring them into the kingdom. Now remember, the children's bread is him, okay? He's the bread. He's the bread of life. So what men will do uh, that are in deliverance, I got nothing against deliverance. I just don't like when people twist scriptures to confirm a belief instead of what it's actually saying. They'll say, because he cast this demon out of this girl, then the children's bread must be casting out devils to Christians. That's what they'll say. They'll say, because he said, I've been only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. And obviously there was a demon in this girl. So we're to assume because he can cast a demon out of this person saying that the bread is for the children that now that we're born again, I'm a child of God. And because I'm a child of God, then you should cast the devil out of me because that's what the bread is. But that's not what he's saying in context. Okay, hear me out. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Now, in 27, this is 1527, the word there that you need to highlight is master, okay? Their master's table. Now, master here is not rabbi. It's master. She's not calling them rabbi. She's calling them master. Now, you have to ask yourself, why does she use the word master? Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto you, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. So, within that hour, her daughter was healed. He didn't see her. He didn't talk. It doesn't even say that she's here. It just says that the woman's there. So he just said, let it be unto you. Let the faith be unto you. So she's asking to deliver her daughter. And he said, hey, great is your faith. Let it be un done unto you. So I want to talk about, and this is what I mean by surface level. Surface level Christian would just read this, surface level. And there's nothing wrong with that because you have four soils. 
right? I talk about this. You have Peshat, you had uh, Ramez, you have Drosh, and you have Sod. There's four levels, right? And the Bible talks about there's four rivers that flow out of Eden. These four levels are soils. When Jesus gives the... Um, when he gives the parable of, of the seeds, he's not talking about the seed. He's talking about the soil. He's saying, what type of soil are you? Because I'm going to throw the seed. And it's all about you. Like, will you receive this seed? What soil are you? Are you are you a Peshat? Which means, you know, the seed's going to fall and it's going to sit on the side and birds are going to get it and, it's, you know, it's going to die. Or are you are you Drosh? You know, are, are you Ramez? Ramez is like it's going to... You know, it's going to grow a little bit, but the roots ain't going to, you know, and it's going to get choked out. Or, or are you, are you, um, are you uh, um, a drosh? Are you, you know, are you, is this your soul? Are you sod? Are you the one where the, the word's actually going to take root and it's going to change your life? So he's asking, this is what the parable is in context. That's what he's saying. But we don't get that. We get, oh, it's about the seed. It's not about the seed. It's about the soil. Where are you planting the seed? Are you planting the seed in good soil? The seed is the word of God. The seed is the Christ. That's the seed. The seed's not the issue. The seed's never the issue. It's, are you going to receive this seed? Are you going to receive this word? There's nothing wrong with the word. The word, there's nothing wrong with it. It's the soil. Will you receive it? Will you allow this word to, to take root? Will you let it be choked out? Will the things of the world rob you of what I'm going to say? So he's speaking to them as a rabbi. And as a rabbi, he's asking them, who are you? Because I'm about to give something to you and what you do with it according to your faith, according to you, according to what you do with this is going to determine what happens. Okay. So let's talk about why she's talking about bread, bread and why he's talking about bread. Okay. And you'll find this in first Kings. It's in first Kings. It's in the text. This is why I tell people, don't just read one verse. Don't just read one verse because you're going to read one verse and you're going to get stuck there. But the word is intertwined. It's a web. It's all connected. You'll find it in the text. The text will answer every question you have because it's in there. So the question is, why does she call him master? Why does the Bible tell us that he's in Sidon? And why is the woman talking about bread? And why does she say crumb? And why did he say to her, your faith, man, that's some, that's some great faith you got there. That's yeah, okay, well, because you believe that, then I'll give it to you. Even though it wasn't lawful, he still gave it to her. But let's read it in context, okay? So in 1 Kings chapter 17, there was a man. This is the first man that we hear about in the text that they call him master. So they want you to know that when she said master, this is not a Jew. So this person who says master is getting the word master from something else. So when she sees master, she sees something else. She doesn't see a rabbi. She sees something else, okay? So this is very interesting. And Elijah, the Tishabite, who was in the habitations of, of, of Gilead, said unto Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. So Elijah made it stop raining. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself from the brook uh, Cherith, and is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, and, it, and before the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread, watch this, and flesh. In the morning, and the bread and the flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. Now, here's, here's vital right here. This is where it gets in interesting. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up. And because there had been no rain in the land, the word of the Lord God came unto him, saying, Here it is. Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Sidon. Okay. Why is it saying Sidon? It says Sidon because this is the exact same place that this woman comes to Jesus. It's the region, okay? Now, there was a man there a while back. His name was Elijah in the region. Now, what did he do in this area in the region? Here it goes. 
and dwell there, behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So there's a woman there who's not Jewish. She's a Gentile. But God says, Elijah, go to this Gentile woman. Now watch this. So he arose and went to Seraphath and went, and he came to the gate of the city. Behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks, and he called to her, and he said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread. A morsel. Bring me some bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not cake, but a handful of meal in barrel and a little oil in a, in, a cur, in, a, in a crust. And behold, I am gathering two sticks and I may go and dress it for me and my son. Vital. This woman has a daughter. This woman has a son. Watch this. That we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, fear not. Now remember, she's not Jewish. She's a Gentile. But God sent a man of God to provide for her. To provide for her. Watch this. And Elijah said unto her, fear not. Go and do as thou hast said. But make me thereof a little cake first and bring it unto me. And after, make for thee and for thy son. So make me the bread first, the little bread that you have. Make it for me, offer it to me, and then make some for you and your son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste. Oh, that's so vital. Neither shall the crust of oil fail unto the day that the Lord sent the rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house did eat many days, and the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the curse of oil fall according to the word of, according, fail according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. So why is this vital? So the text wants you to know that Jesus is in the exact same place that Elijah was. Now this woman is asking for help, and Jesus tells her, look, I can't help you because um, you're not a Jew. But she says, wait a minute, there was a man here. This is, this is the story. What she's saying is this. Even the dogs eat from the master's table. Meaning, I know the story. I know what happened. I know there was a man here who was a master. Right? That's where you get the word rabbi from. Master. He was the first one called master. He was the one that had disciples. That's where you get it from. Elijah. Elisha. And there was a man here. And he gave a woman bread. Even though even though you're saying that it's not lawful to give the children's bread to the dogs and explain to me, because I'm having an issue here mentally, why did Elijah help the woman? Why did he do that? And it's about compassion. It's about the love of God and saved her and her son. She's just asking, help my daughter. And so when she recognized it, he recognized it when she says, even the dogs eat from the master's table, this is what she's talking about. This is what the text is trying to bring you back to because you have to read in the text, why does she say master? Why does it say Sadan? And anyone who knows their word will say, okay, Sadan, what happened in Sadan? Okay, why does she say master when bread? So there's three things, master, Sadan, and bread. And what is that? That's the story of Elijah. And that's what it's about. But you won't get that. You won't understand that. You won't understand the text, the context in which it's happening. But what's vital about this story is there's no oil in the story. There's only bread. Why wasn't the oil talked about? I'm going to leave that for you to dig in the search. Why was there not no oil in the story? Why is there only bread? Right? Because the oil in this story is the anointing that is in the vessel who is the Christ. And he's the one that gives the bread and his anointing and the spirit that's in him will never dry out. So he'll never run out of bread and he'll never run out of oil because he is the oil and he is the bread. Do you see how that works? 
So when people say, because of this story, this means that children can have demons and devils. That is not the context of the story. That is not what this is about. This is about Jesus has what you need and it'll never run out. He has all the bread you need. He has all the oil you need. He has everything that'll sustain you. Jesus has that. And that's why he went to the lost sheep of Israel to give them the bread of life because they didn't have it. To give them the oil that was in them, which was, which was the Holy Spirit. To give them everything that they needed so they could live in a time of famine. This woman was in famine. Her daughter was vexed. She needed sustenance. Not sustenance that we as mere mortals need. She needed something that was in the vessel. She needed something that no one could give her that only could come from God. That's what she needed. And she knew this. Look, bread's not going to work. Oil's not going to work. I got to look beyond. You got to give me something here. And, and he's saying, I can't give it to you. It's not lawful. And then this is when she's like, okay. But even the dogs get, Elijah gave it. If Elijah gave it, if he gave it, right? If he gave it, that's the context, right? It's very beautiful. It's beautiful how things are written. So that's what I mean by, by drawing out and looking, looking and digging and searching. Very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. So guys, um, read your word. Get into it. You know, and I try to tell people this. Look, if you don't know your word, if you don't know what you're talking about and certain things, and hear me out, this is why we make disciples, guys. This is why we teach people the word of God. Because remember, the enemy's trying to rob you of God's truth. His truth. And there's so much that God has for us in the word of God that will allow us to, to live accordingly and to receive everything that God has for us. We have all the bread we need. We have all the oil we need. We have all the healing we need. We have everything we need. We have everything that pertains to life and godliness. We have it. So how do you tap into it? How do you tap into it? Because it's on the inside of you. How do you draw it out? And this is what the story of Moses is going to be about. His name means to draw out because they drew him out of the well. And in the same way, God will put people in your life to draw you out, to draw you out. That's what it's all about, okay? So Moses wants to draw you out, but he's the reflection and he's the, the foreshadow of Jesus who's going to draw you out. He'll draw you out. He'll draw not just you out. He'll draw out everything that he is. He'll draw everything out into it's a It's a beautiful, beautiful story. So we're going to talk about the Exodus story. So I just want to show you a little bit of what I'm talking about, about diving into the scriptures, digging deep, and, and looking for what it is that God is trying to show you. And if you see it from the wrong lens, and I get it, guys, hear me out. The only reason I started digging this deep is because I ran into some things scripturally that didn't make any sense. So I had to dig deep. I had to look. I had to search. And so uh, God has given me the ability to sit here and study. But I don't just study for me. I study because I need to feed his sheep. So whatever I get, I'm going to give to you. I'm going to give to you. I'm going to draw it out. I'm going to lay it out for you. Because I'm a teacher. I'm not just a minister of the word. I don't just lay hands on the sick. I don't just do the things that God has called me to do. i got to go around preaching and teaching. Preaching and teaching. So preaching is when you're talking about something. Teaching is when you're saying, okay, this is, whoops, this is what it means. Sorry, guys. This is what it means. And that's what a teacher does. And this is why Jesus teaches in parables. Because he's drawing you out. It's very, 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 very amazing. So, guys, Monday night. We're going to do it. Monday night, 6 p.m. Okay? 6 p.m. So, guys, love you guys in the name of Jesus. I got to go. Um, I have students here. And I'm going to go to the gym, and then I'm going to go sit down with them. We did day two yesterday. Today's day three. We're going to have at it. And, uh, man, I had a good time yesterday. I was, <laughs> we had a blast. So, guys, we have a school. And hear me out. I'm, I'm taking, um, what's up, Gustavo? I am taking all of March off um, because we're taking time. I'm ironing some things out, and we're going to start the school up again in April. Hear me out. We're going to have three schools in April. I am going to push these schools, man, because I got so much that I'm bringing to the table. I'm going to add a day. I'm adding a day to these three schools. I'm adding a day. I want to see how that works, and I'm going to do them back to back. So this is in April. Come to the school. Come sit down. Break bread. Let's get in our word. Let's iron things out, right? Let's get into the, into the meat, man, into the meat. So I love you guys in the name of Jesus. If you want to come to the school, 
www.royalfamilyinternational.com. You can come, you can register, come get trained, right? And one of the guys asked me last night, he said, why is it that you've shifted um, from laying hands on the sick and going out there and moving in the kingdom to teaching the word? I'm like, bro, I'm doing both. What are you talking about? I'm doing both. I'm doing both. It's amazing because now in context, I understand when I'm out there doing what it is that God has called me to do, I understand. I understand. Like now it's, it's different because it resonates in me. Now I'm understanding like, oh, okay. Oh, oh, it's different because now you get to see and you can use the context of what's going on. And it's very, very interesting. Uh, the school is six days, Monday to Tuesday. Um, you stay with me in a building and uh, eat together, talk together. If you know, just get a hold of alumni, they'll tell you. This is not fluff. My school that God, and when I say my school, is because I take ownership of it, but it's his school. Um, I'm the administrator. It is not fluff. This is not a fluff school, man. This is like, if you don't know your word, you're going to know it. You're going to know it. And I'm going to show you how to read it and how to dig into it because this sustains us. The word of God, you got to know what you're talking about. Because remember, the enemy's trying to rob you of his truths. That's what he's trying to do. He's just trying to rob you of truth, of righteousness. He's trying to rob you of all the things that the armor of God is. And we use a weapon, and the weapon is the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. This is your sword. This is what you fight with right here. You fight for truth with truth. That's how you fight. You fight with this. And if you don't know this, if you don't know this, how do you fight a lie if you don't know truth? Right? So, I love you guys in the name of Jesus. Monday night, 6 p.m., we're going to be talking about Exodus. So, I love you guys in the name of Jesus. Um, hopefully, this has blessed you. So guys, um, yeah, so be blessed, be blessed and pray for us, man. Pray for us and go to www.royalfamilymedia.net and, and you can jump on there and I'm throwing all the Bible studies on there. I'm throwing the whole series on there. So I love you guys in the name of Jesus. Be blessed, be blessed, be blessed.